have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name, because my because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. But you will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. His name will be Solomon, and I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. He is the one who will build a house for my name. He will be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Okay. So that's where it starts off with um, David being the king and the Lord promising him he's going to have a son named Solomon. Where David, with the, with a lot of wars, it says in that scripture that there's a lot of wars that were waged, a lot of blood was shed. And the Lord promised him he's going to have a son named Solomon, which is going to be a king. He's also going to be known as a guy of, um, of wisdom and peace, kind of the opposite of his father. Um, and then I just wanted to go over really quick First Kings, if you want to turn to First Kings 3. 1 Kings 3. And it's 7 through 13. Anyone want to read that? No, I'll read it. Amanda? Uh, 7 through 13, yes. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king against my father David, for I am only a little child, and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen. Great people, too, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people, and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people? Stop there. I just want to make a point. Um, <laughs> 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 no, we'll continue. Because I figured you guys would get lost if I try to go back. But um, right away, he's just, all Solomon's saying is he's trying to, um, he's only asking for discernment. That's all he's asking. And he's just asking God, you know, all I want to do is discern between good and evil. That's all I'm asking for. Um, so that's all he's asking of God. Okay, continue. <laughs> the Lord was pleased that Solomon should ask for this. So God said to him, You have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering, administering justice. I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never be, never have been anyone like you nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. Good. Um. I wanted to read there because it's such a great illustration as far as like Solomon just coming to God humble, saying, listen, all I ask for is discernment between good and evil. And God saying, you know, just be, you only ask for that. And because you've only asked for that, I'm going to bless you with more. I'm going to give you the riches. I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to give you everything. I'm going to make you king. And this is where God starts to take off and just bless um, Solomon. Um, and I wanted to, to go over a few different things. I'm going to give you a little bit more background of Solomon. Um, it says, the biblical king Solomon was known for his wisdom, his wealth, and his writings. Solomon was the son of King David. Solomon was not the oldest son of David, but David promised uh, Bathsheba that Solomon would be the next king. When David's elder son, Adijah, declared himself king, David ordered his servants to bring Solomon to Gahan Spring, where the priest anointed him while David was still alive. So Solomon, his dad's passing away, but he wanted to make sure before... Um, he passed away that he anointed his son Solomon everything. Um, it says, and Solomon inherited a considerable empire from his father. Although <coughs> although he was a ruler at a young age, the son, uh, he soon became known for his wisdom. Okay, now from studying all this, I had no idea that Solomon was actually the story in the Bible. You guys hear about the story about the, the women that fought over the baby? Two women? Okay, for some of you who don't, I'm going to go over it really quick because it's talking about how he was known as the, the wisest man. And this is a story that I think illustrates his, his wisdom in it. Um, it says, It was a heartbreaking scene. Two women stood before the King Solomon, each claiming, to the, each claiming that they were the mother of the same boy. The first mother told of how she had the second woman, she had the second woman had even give birth to a son three days apart. Her son was born first. The second mother accidentally laid on her son while sleeping. The baby died. Discovering that, her son was dead. The second mother switched the babies, placing her dead son beside the first mother while sleeping, then taking the first mother's living son to bed. So she swapped babies, one's dead, one's alive. Um, it says, 
When the first mother arose in the morning to nurse her son, she found out the boy was dead. But on a closer examination, she discovered it wasn't it was uh, the other mother's child. She knew her son was in the arms of the second mother. Now standing anxiously before the king, because they went before the king to debate about this, she hoped that he would somehow perceive she was the one telling the truth so he could be reunited with the baby. Solomon issued the verdict. Bring me the sword. Divide the living child in half. He wanted to take the baby and said, since you guys can't agree who's the baby, he's going to cut the baby directly in half. Um, and gave him half and the other one half. The, the, two mas uh, the two mothers' reactions were worlds apart. The first mother pleaded with the king, Oh my lord, give her the living child, and by no means kill the baby. The second mother's words were chilling. Let him be neither mine nor yours. Divide the baby. Their reactions told the king all that he needed to know. The, the king's, king Solomon said, Give the first woman the living child, he ordered and by no means kill him, for he knew that that was the mother. Because the real mother obviously didn't want the baby to die. So she spoke out and said, give it to the other mother. And by Solomon seeing that, being wise, he gave the baby back to the real mother. Um, that was just a story I thought was really neat. Um, but I wanted to illustrate King Solomon because in our lives, there's times where God, we ask for things, and God definitely, he blesses us. Sometimes above and beyond what we really we need. Um, and Sometimes I think throughout our lives, especially my own, I think that where we get blessed, we also need to ask God to be ask for some wisdom and to be humble. Because a lot of times we can get something and we can turn our own blessing into our own curse. Mm -hmm. Just like, I don't know, God, you know, I need a new car and you get blessed with a fancy car, a sporty car. Then all of a sudden you're just getting speeding tickets left and right because you can't handle it. <laughs> Turning a blessing into a curse. Yeah. Okay. Um, but anyways, Solomon in his walk with God, when he was blessed with a lot of things, um, he ended up taking, he actually ended up, um, throughout time, letting everything to do his head. He actually ended up taking what God has blessed him with, and instead of doing the right things and stewarding it the right way, he ended up, actually, in this story, ended up getting a thousand wives. Um, yeah, I was going to say once enough, but I wouldn't know because I'm not married, but, um, and I'm going to get shot. So, <laughs> um, but anyways... <laughs> There's not enough guys in here to back me up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, anyways, that's the blessing um, that God has blessed him with. And I'm going to now get into Solomon and how the blessing actually turned into the curse and went downward spiral from there. It says, ironically, Solomon's success um, was very successful, um, or his not keeping in perspective in relationship to God who gave him all led to his failure. And actually, in all actuality, it was more of a slide than, than a fall. He came to trust in his wealth and political power more than God, who made it all possible in the first place. His great wealth and uh, diplomatic influence allowed him to collect a home of a thousand women from all sorts of nations that the Lord had that the Lord had told the Israelites not to get involved with. He ended up turning the wives um, into idols. Solomon may not have outright rejected God, um, but he continued and he even continued to worship God. Um, but he compromised the truth by tolerating all sorts of paganism um, at the same time. His weak and foolish judgment resulted in the very desired consequences of the kingdom of Israel. Um, so it's even saying here, which related well to my life, just because we're disobedient to God doesn't mean we're flat out rejecting God. I mean, he even said in here that he was even worshiping God while he was doing all this stuff, um, which I think that stood out to me a lot because there's a lot of times where we put on these facades that we're really loving God and we're all about Jesus and we slap a sticker on our car or whatever and we're all good. But then inside and our secret life, it's another whole story. And I am just as guilty as anyone else with that. Um, another thing I wanted to illustrate as far as Solomon's story, um, I don't know if anyone wants to be brave enough to even speak about this, but we'll start with the blessing. Does anyone know in here that God was directly telling him something to do and they're obedient to it, and God actually blessed them for it. Does anyone have any illustrations? It could be recent, it could have been 10 years ago. Anything? I'll start off with one, and you guys can think, but um, I would say in my own life, um, getting back in school um, is something that I feel like I was passing all the tests that God was throwing at me, but there was one that God was kept saying, go back to, go back to, and I just kept ignoring it. And I felt like in my life, I've been in such a dry season 
um, where I was doing what I was doing to get by, but I really wasn't moving forward. And sometimes, like Joel said, he even said before this, he started the Bible study in church, that God said to him, you know, go back to the last thing that I asked you to do. Because sometimes we keep trying to move forward ourselves, and God's going, you know, that's nice and all, but why don't you go back to the last thing I told you to be obedient to? And once you do that, it's kind of like you're opening a door, and then he can start to bless you. And um, I think with schooling in my life, I finally um, started that. And he put everything in order. He put the right people in my life to help me get by. Um, he put the right teacher in my way. Um, I started getting better grades than I did in high school. And it just opened up a, another whole door, uh, another whole thing for my life. So that's one for me um, as far as a blessing um, out of obedience. Does anyone, can anyone think of anything else? Last summer, I felt like I was still living in Pennsylvania. And that's why I got saved and everything. But from here, and I felt like I should move back home. And so God opened up a job here, and I moved back home. And my dad gave his life to the Lord, and other parents just got baptized, and tons of other stuff happened through it. But wow, just like God. Wow, like, that's awesome. huge. So just that would be this for you. Other yeah. people are blessed in return. Yeah. See, that's what a lot of people need to take note of. You think you're doing something, and it's going to come back to you. Sometimes it doesn't just hit you. It's, it's like a domino effect. That's awesome. Wow, praise God for that. Um, anyone want to give an example? How do they uh, were disobedient? No. <laughs> Ashley? Yeah. Really? That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. I, I actually want more. more. Really? Um, I was just joking. It's kind of personal, but everything Ellen and me went through, we were separated for almost a year, and I feel like even though there was grounds for us to be separated at the time, I think the way I went about it was really wrong and really disrespectful to him and really selfish on my part. And I think um, our, all throughout our Christian lives, like, we always have to take a step of faith even when we don't feel like that's what we're supposed to be doing. We have to trust the Lord. And I feel like we were separated for so long mainly because of my my own fears and everything like that. And I think like the devil was really trying to like come at me the whole time. And I think like finally like when <clears throat> and I, I mean I was coming to church, I was going to Bible study and everything like that. And it was really just like my own fears that were keeping us apart. And I feel like yeah like we still have so much to to work through but we've been back together for like living back together for like over a month and like I know that the Lord's like going to be doing a lot through us and like you know our, with our testimony and everything and I'm really excited and like Luke and Laura have been helping us and, and stuff like that and I just I know that this is what God has for us I know it wasn't like the way it was before that's not what God had like both of us were depressed and broken and I'm really like thankful to like all the support here and like God like restoring us and like there's still so much more that has to be done but I'm just thankful for the Lord of all that he's like taught us and shown us like through this past year and everything. Definitely. Wow. For you guys. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny because you're like, Ashley, I was like going to say something. I'm going to be joking. <laughs> I thought like, oh, you said that. <laughs> no, we're definitely joking. I know you're joking, but I just might as well. Um, but anyway. Yeah. Well, I would say like for the majority of us, not everyone, so don't, you know, feel like I'm picking anyone out, but I'm just saying, I think a lot of it's relationships. I mean, most of the people here, you know, 25 and under. Um, 26 and under. So that's something maybe we battled with, whether it was God's will or not. Um, I'm bringing that up because I think four years ago when I actually was dating, um, it's not, I, I guess I made justifications along the way. I dated a girl for three years. Um, I kept trying to say, you know, maybe this is God's will. It is. And I tried to say it was instead of it actually being. I was very disobedient. And because of that, I think for my a uh, couple years of my life, um, I suffered for it. But at the same time, it's made me who I am today. It's, it's I've grown from it. Um, can't go back in time, but I've definitely taken the good out of it, and I'm grown from it. Um, but another thing I wanted to share besides the story of Solomon, where he was blessed, and then he turned the blessing into the disaster, um, a biblical principle, honestly, like that is very debatable, would be tithing. Um, just you know, biblically, ten percent, yeah. But I think that. If you have the money and you're, you're, you're tithing 10%, maybe there's someone else that you can um, sponsor, or maybe there's other things you can do. Um, myself, I feel, you know, giving 10%, you know, is right. And I feel if scripturally it says, I'm going to give you a scripture that kind of backs up tithing. Um, because honestly, everything is from God above. He owns everything. He, he is the master. He deserves everything. He deserves all the glory. And even in Malachi 3 9 it says, Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me. Okay. And it's pretty much flat out saying in that that, man, you're not even giving back to me. I you know, I own everything and you're hogging it. And there is a biblical story 
where there was um, gold um, that God demanded that be given, and I don't remember who it was, but they actually took some of the gold and hid it in their tent, um, away from God, thinking that he wouldn't notice Achan. that. Who was it? Achan. Achan? Achan. Achan. Yeah. Okay, and he hid it in his own tent, thinking God wouldn't see that, and it actually was a curse of his whole family, and I don't know if it was all of Israel, all of Israel because he wanted some of the gold to himself. So, um, do, do you know what the consequence of that was? No, go ahead. Not only he, but his entire family and some of their were all killed. They're all killed. Okay. Well, I am not talking anything uh, anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I will share it in one second. But I'll give you some more examples as far as tithing. I mean, I was looking up a lot of research on that biblically and online, and uh, I found some stuff is really neat. You know, even just ten, um, ten answers. You know, one being to honor God, our Creator. You know, that's first. You know, I mean, we don't. We shouldn't give just because we feel like we want to give back. We should give because he owns everything. And he des and he deserves everything. Um, two, to acknowledge his inherit uh, your own inheritance because God he blesses um, he blesses a cheerful giver. He really does. And if you're, he, he tests your heart when you are giving. If you're giving just to give, he knows. Um, and one two of them that I thought out of the ten that are that's you know, kinda had to do with what I was talking about here tonight. Um, it says one to to avoid the curse, um, and then I read out of Malachi. It says, "Ye are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me." Um, and number nine, um, it says to enjoy God's blessing. Um, I think you should give back to God because you love Him, and He doesn't need your money. It's really, honestly, a test of where you're at with God and your own relationship with Him. And by giving it, saying, "I don't want anything returned, but God, everything is yours." He tends to bless us um, in return. I noticed in seasons in my life where I was not tithing because I felt like, oh, I need it more for this or for that. That was that dry season. I felt like when I started tithing, things in my life started, he started blessing me left and right with different things that sometimes I didn't even need, but I'm like, wow, God, you know, I don't deserve this, but thank you. Um, and there was also some more examples I wanted to give you guys. Um, Bear with me a second. Can I say something? Go ahead. Um, for me, like when it comes to tithing, since you're on that topic, um, like I personally have like a lot of student loan debt and like a lot of like craziness, and like to me, I'm like, I'm like, I, I can't afford this, but you know, what I mean, I wanted to give, and I decided that I was going to give, and that if I'm giving like to God, I'm gonna trust that. He's going to get me through whatever I'm going to get through with the finances that I do have, that 90% of my income or whatever. Um, so, in which when I started doing that, as soon as, like, I was like, how am I going to be able to get gas? Or how am I going to be able to do this? Like, things just kept falling into place. Like, randomly out of nowhere, I was touring my one friend, and, like, out of nowhere, like, as soon as, like, I started tithing more and, like, trying to take care of, you know, making sure. I mean, I didn't do it because I felt like I needed to. I did it because I wanted to. Um, and I, it's really also about trusting in God. And as soon as they were doing that, like my friend's mom started like giving me like money every time I was tutoring her. She was making forty to sixty dollars a week, and that was helping cover the extra expenses of like gas and like other things like that. And um, even just like recently, like I'm like, oh my gosh, like how am I going to be able to afford my time this week? Like I, I am not going to have enough money to budget to get everything through. And um, and then all of a sudden, randomly last week, uh, someone blessed me with like forty bucks, you know, like, for gas, and I was like. It came at the perfect time because I needed the money, and um, it's just crazy. Like when you just trust in God and you really give from your heart, like how He'll just He'll take care of you completely. Um, I also I, I wanted to share with you something. Um, you guys all heard the story about the Good Samaritan, right? Most of you. Okay. Well, what's that? The Good Samaritan. Oh, Good Samaritan. Yeah. Okay. Well. Um, when it comes to tithing and other things, as far as just being a um, person that likes to give, you know, most stubborn people, their their attitudes are, what's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. That's, you know, out of um, pride, being, being stubborn. Um, people that like to steal, um, their attitude is, what's yours is mine, and I'm going to get it. Um, the Good Samaritan's attitude was, what's mine is yours, and you can have it. But there's another attitude that goes above the Good Samaritan, and it says that you should permeate our thinking even above the uh, commendable attitude of the Good Samaritan, everything we belong, everything that we have belongs to God, and we are good stewards of his goods. 
So that's even above the Good Samaritan saying, you know what, not even just we're mine. It's not even mine, it's God's. And I thought that was really neat. Um, there's been a lot of things maybe in my own life where I held back from giving because I felt like if I give it, you know, what about me, God? And I, I think the times that I actually said, you know what, I'm going to give this even though I don't know what's going to happen next. I gave it and God blessed me in the turn. And with tithing, there was a story um, that I was looking up and it was talking just about people that, I'm not saying this is for every situation, but a lot of people that go, you know what, I, maybe I'll just tithe next time or they keep putting it off. And they find out that, you know, no, I need it for auto repairs. You know, I, I need it for that, you know, whatever, student loan, I need it for this or that. And you find out that when you actually are tithing, a lot of that stuff you don't have to do because God is providing. But when you're actually taken away from God and you're doing what you think you need to do with it, then you find yourself having all these things that come up. These repairs, these this, this health problem, this and that. Um, and one last thing I wanted to go over. Um, oh, Can I go ahead. Show you a scripture? Yeah, please do. Second Corinthians uh, 9, 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necess necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. It's perfect. Um, another thing as far as our blessings, when we're, when we're praying about things, we'll really ask for God for things, and he does bless us. I think sometimes we're, we have a one-track mind where we're like, God, this is where we need to be blessed. I want you to bless it this way. And God comes in another whole direction and blesses us this way. And we take us off guard. And a scripture that we all know, Joel said plenty of times, I think Paul, Paul had said it two weeks ago, was it Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. And I think that's so true. And it says, from as far as heavens are higher, on the earth, higher than the earth, um, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I think that's perfect because sometimes we're looking for something to come through, and God comes through another way. I can say in my life, I think I have patience, but I think that's the one thing that God keeps trying to help me out with more. And I'm scratching my head going, you know, why? You know, I feel like I'm good with patience. Why are you helping me with that? And sometimes God will bring me someone in my life that could drive me crazy, test my patience but I, I realized honestly that's a blessing it really is and it's coming from this way instead of thinking no I you know I need to be blessed this way God comes in from another way because it actually helps me out helps me adjust my attitude it helps my thinking and um, another scripture I want to go over and I felt like it was crucial for all this as far as um, being blessed is patience um, honestly a lot of us when we're waiting for something for God to go through we're sitting back like we're like in the hammock in the shade with a little umbrella and drink you know God poured on my lap I'm good when is it going to come and God's going no that's not how it works there's a way when you are being patient being proactive in in believing what God's going to do and even proclaiming he's going to do it for you instead of sitting back being like I don't know if he will because it says God moves on faith alone you know if you're sitting back going I don't know God's going I'm waiting to release this but why don't you pick up your faith a little bit and then I'll bless you um Patience, and this is Hebrews 6, uh, verse 12, says, We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who, through faith and patience, in inherit what has been promised. And I think that faith and patience is key. There's a lot of things in our life we could say, you know, God, we have the faith. I've been, I've been believing. I have the faith. And God's going, great. I'm glad you have that down. Where's your, where's your patience now? Because a lot of times we, we're expecting things in our time. Well, God's time is different than ours. And sometimes we expect it to come through when we want to. And sometimes, you know, the reason, God has a reason for everything. I've come to learn that. And say we want it in our own time. And God actually blesses us in that time that we think. He, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows that if maybe he give it to us then, it would be a destruction for us. And he makes sure that maybe throughout that time of patience, he's molding us so we can actually handle what he wants to bless with us. Um, and another thing out of obedience if you're looking for something for God to bless you or something in a huge way you know it why don't you start off by you know starting with the little things if you can bless if he's going to bless you something small he can bless you something big if you're not I don't know making your bed in the morning and your mom asks you to do that and then you're asking your you know someone for 10 grand I honestly think that God does know your heart he can trust you with little he can trust you with a lot and I think that in my own life I've been looking for big things to come through 
and God's been testing you going, listen, you know, I'm bringing you right back to some simple practical things that you've been avoiding, you've been putting off on the shelf and not doing. Um, and there was also another scripture. It's in 1 Kings 11 through 4. Does anyone want to read that? 1 Kings 11 through 4. Oh, what chapter? 1 Kings 11. I did. I'm sorry. I'm rushing. I'm nervous. I don't know. I'm nervous. Mike and nervous. Eleven through four. Eleven. Just read four. Four. Yeah, just read four and uh, and five. Four and five. I hope this is it. Eleven. As Solomon grew old, his eyes turned to me. No, go. No. I was just trying to do it along. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as his as the heart of David his father. Okay, I'm going back to that because I wanted to go back to the whole obedience thing. Um, being blessed is, is a privilege. I mean, God knows what you can handle, what you can't. And if you're asking above your means, I mean, he simply came to God and said, that's all I'm asking for is to discern between good and evil. Um, and God blessed him for that, but he ended up turning it the wrong way. And um, I just think in, in our own lives, I think, there's also a scripture that says, bad company corrupts good, good, good character. Yeah. And I think just obedience in Christ, God puts certain people around us for a reason. He really does. Just like this is a huge family, and I think we should really take advantage of our friends that are here. Um, but I honestly think that when you're around people that aren't saved or maybe people that don't know much about Christ, it's not like, oh, let's kick them out of our lives. No, the reason for our walk is to reach out to the lost. But I think that you need to be wise in who you do hang out with and in what you do with them. And I think that that's obedience in itself. Um, God can say, you know what I mean, like, that crowd, you're not ready for that, to re even reach out to them. I know you're a Christian, but I don't think you're ready to really reach out to them like you say you're going to. Because you go hang out with them, what do you do? You act just like them. And you start falling into their patterns, next thing you know, you're, you're just as bad. And I, I'm not saying that goes for everyone, I think it's between you and God, but I honestly think that when you feel like you're solid enough, it, you shouldn't ignore the people that aren't saved. Our job is to reach out to them, and being obedient is, you know, spreading the gospel any way we can to the saved and unsaved. Um, if we get into our, our little bubble, um, say, you know, we, we say we're worshiping God and we're being obedient, yet if you notice our circle of friend, circle friends is only Christians, I honestly think, and this is probably strong to me to say it, but there's a problem with that. Because if you're only reaching out to your Christian friends and you're a little bubble, who's reaching out to the world? No one. And um, even in our own careers, you know, there's a lot of people here that are in careers that are missionary careers. You're in the hospital, you know, you're on the job anywhere, and you're yeah. you're you're seeing people every day that don't know Christ. It's your mission field. That's right. <laughs> yes. it's your mission field. But I just think it's it's really needed to be obedient to Christ in every which way where it doesn't matter where you're at. It could be your friends, it could be making your bed, it could be, I don't know, not having a thousand wives. Um, <laughs> but uh, Mom, there's also something you wanted to share too. Yeah. the church to where they understood and began to see the holiness and the righteousness of God. That he wasn't going to tolerate that kind of thing. And here he's saying, you know, it was yours to begin with. 
you said you were going to sell it and you were going to do what everyone else was doing to pitch in and to help out. And here you went and you held back part of it and then lied. And his wife was in, in conspiracy with him in that lie. And because of it, it cost both of them their lives. And he said, the important thing was, he said, you did not lie to man, you lied to the Holy Spirit. And that's really important to realize that we think we're just accountable down here on earth to people. It's more than that. You know, when you claim to know Christ, you are accountable to him. And although he loves us, he also does have rules and, and, um, and laws set in motion through his word. And to disobey, that is what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. So that was one of the examples. Um, I think a lot of the time for, for many Christians, I think we get caught up in not not so much am I obeying or disobeying God, but is this really what God wants me to do or is this what I want to do? You know, and you're we're fighting back and forth with our, in our minds, like, you know, is this God or is it not God? Is it me? You know, is it just the people around me telling me to do this? Are they speaking from God or are they just telling me what they think? And, you know, we get very confused and we start overanalyzing everything. But I think, you know, when it comes down to should I do this or should I not do this, you have to think of, you know, in the, in the eternal mindset, you know, what kind of impact is this going to make eternally, you know, for the Lord? I think we get very caught up in immediate gratification, what feels good right now, what is going to help me right now, even if it's going to cause damage later. You know, oh, we'll deal with it later, you know, when it messes up, but right now, this is what I need right now. So I think, you know, when you're, when you're entering a situation and you're trying to figure out, you know, what is obedience, you know, what is God calling me to do, what is he not calling me to do, Really pray it out and, and don't look at it from the world aspect of, oh, this is going to bring me money, this is going to bring me power, this is going to set me up for the next step, you know. Really look at it from with an eternal mindset. Um, one example that I have of obedience is when, it was 10 years ago, and I was looking for a career change from motel management. And I had two jobs staring me in the face. Um, I could be a youth director for United Methodist Church, or I can do this... Um, like administrative sales job that would have definitely paid me at least double what I would make doing the youth director job. And I had all these red flags about the one and I felt total peace about going with the youth director job and I'm like, but we really need the money. But you know, I ended up going with the youth director job and it was like the greatest year and a half that I was there, year and a half of my life, like just watching kids go from totally like lukewarm Christians awesome. to like on fire, excited for God, like changing their schools, everything. And I was I like, look back at it now and I'm like, thank God, that's what I did, you know? I, I made the right decision with that. And I mean, just seeing, we're in, see, even keeping in contact with them today on Facebook and stuff, like still seeing them on fire for God and pursuing the Lord, like that's all the blessing I need from it. That's all the great things I need. Ellen, Ellen, she's from there. So, that's just, you know, think eternally, don't think immediate gratification. And I, I was also going to say, like, deep, small or big things, we also need to think about, like, uh, here on earth, like, we're leaving a legacy for generations to come, like, our children, our children's children, and, like, when, like, whatever decision we choose, like, it's going to affect not just us, I mean, and obviously it's going to, it's our testimony about the Lord, but, like, our kids and our kids' kids and, like, that's why, like, it just breaks my heart when I see, like, teenagers, like, all caught up in this stuff. And it, because it's, like, they're not realizing, like, this is going to affect their whole life. And then, like, something could happen. Like, they could end up, like, pregnant or whatever. And it's, like, in a situation like that, like, then there's just no going back, you know. And it's, it's just so crucial, like, these teenagers. And that's really, like, on, on, my, heart, on my heart, like, teenagers. Because I remember, like, I mean, I wasn't the worst teenager. <laughs> Except, you know, I wasn't the worst, but I wasn't the best, you know. And, I mean, there's so many things I would do differently. Like, nothing really bad yeah, horrible happened system. when I was younger. But... I just, that's really just like, I'm really happy for teenagers. And like, that's why I'm so, yeah. so excited about this ministry because we're so reaching out to our generation and I just, it's really exciting. Awesome. Anyone have anything else? Uh, Amanda? Um, this is just, it's applicable in regards to tithing and just obedience in general. Um, I was reading my almost first eyes the other day, which if you don't read it, I fully recommend it. It's yeah. amazing. Um, but he was just talking in like regards to obedience that so often we talk about how um, I'm going to give God 
of the money I make and I'm going to give him this much time before I go to bed or in the morning and by saying those things while they are they are godly we almost assume that like we have a right to the things we have so the yep. paycheck I get I have a right to the other 90% and then 10% is God's but what we have to realize is that everything we have is God's and the only thing that we have a right to and the only thing that we can truly give up to God that isn't already His is our right to ourselves. Um, so, which goes along with obedience too. The only thing that we have to give that is ours is being obedient. And in regards to our entire life, not just with monetary things, but in every aspect and every step we take is obedience to Him. And that's all we have to give. Amen. I can run stuff that. So, my heart's hot, so I'm just going to have to share. Yeah. Um, so, like, here's... <laughs> I love her. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Along with obedience, like, obviously, like, our life is not our own. Like, Christ died for us. And in the Bible, so many times, it's just, like, me. It always says, like, take up your cross, follow God. Like, we should be giving our all, sacrificing ourselves to Christ in every single way. So, if you think about it, and you take obedience, and you just break it down, live along that... If you're a living sacrifice for, for Jesus, like he's calling you to be, then every single decision that you make, it should be with consulting Jesus. Because, like, it can even be, like, like asking God, to, like, if you should, like, go to, like, a certain party or if you should go to, like, just hanging out with friends or anything. Like, every single decision that you make should be with, like, thinking about, like, what what does God want you to do in the long run? Because also, for me, it's not only blessed, blessed yourself, but the long thing you said with how you came at home and your whole family got blessed, like, your obedience is not just a blessing for yourself, but it's also meant to be a blessing for others. So it's like if you're praying if you should like go to balls today and or like or I don't know, and like you feel like that you shouldn't go. Like if you listen to God's voice in that, he could be protecting you from something like horrible that happens at the mall. Or like if you pray and you feel like you should go to the mall, God could be setting up a divine like appointment with somebody else to preach the gospel and share his word or to just bless somebody else. So obedience when it comes down to it, like like we should just like if you just I don't know like I wouldn't be coming home, but um, I don't know just like, keep in mind like we should be preaching the gospel no matter where we are we're supposed to just be just living and just walking sacrifices for Jesus and it's blessing everybody who crosses our path so not only is it for ourselves but it's for the world around us so yeah and walking in step yeah <laughs> just have the spirit lead and guide you every single day I <laughs> think. <laughs> I think the thing to understand about obedience, I think that's the most important thing, yeah. is that it's a hard attitude. Yeah. Because you can read the Word of God, and you can read it cover to cover, and you can set up a bunch of rigid laws and rules that you try to attain, and you'll never be able to do it if there's not the spirit of the law attached to that, and the spirit of grace. And I think sometimes we need to understand, yes, the Bible talks about tithing, yes, the Bible talks about obedience, but let me tell you, I'm a father, so if my kids... If they go and they clean the room, or they clean the house, because my one son, he's done that several times, my middle child, the one who, sometimes I just want to, like, lock him up, okay? I'm, I'm not kidding you. We've had discussions. Um, he's, he's his own man already, and he's five, so he thinks. Um, I know it. When he, well, the times that I've come home from work, and he's taken it upon himself to go do something, Why? Not because Daddy told him he had to, but because he knew that it blessed Daddy's heart. Those were the times that just I just turned into melted butter and was like, "What do you want?" And you think about it in your lives. I mean, God tells you in His Word, and I have the Bible on my phone. But if I had a Bible in my hand, I would tell you: that you open up the Word, and the Bible says, "You know, you should be tithing." Would it be better for you to not have to follow the Word of God to do it, but you just naturally, instinctively, out of your heart, are like, "Oh my gosh, God, everything's yours." I just I'm bubbling over with thanksgiving. Just take it. Take it. And it's not even 10%. It's 15%. I don't care. It's 20%. I don't care. And Lord, you're going to provide. You're going to take care of me. And you're excited. Think about what that does. You know what I'm saying? As opposed to God saying, you really need to do that. Because when I go to my kids and I'm like, you need to clean your room. And they're like, what? Go clean your room. And then five minutes later, they're still playing around. Go clean your room. Then it's like, then there's a certain side of me that comes out that they don't like to see. Because it's kind of like, I pick them up and I'm like, now go there now. Would you rather have God be that guy? Or do you want God to be like, 
oh my gosh, oh my gosh, Jesus, you got to see these people over here, man. They're just, they're awesome. They bless my heart. Why? Because they're just doing everything because they love me and they just want me and they just want to bless me. And that's what I'm saying. If, if our heart attitude is right, then the things that God has, it's not a matter of you do it because you want God to bless you. God blesses you because your heart wants Him. It's a totally different mindset. And if we don't have the mindset of what God wants, that's see, that's the biggest challenge as Christians. When the Bible talks about transforming your mind, it's not a good thing to say. It is absolutely has to happen. Because the ways that we think in the world are the complete opposite of the way God wants us to think. And so you'll find people coming to church, and you'll find people saying, you have to give, you have to give, you better obey God. I would rather be around people who are just obeying God, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to be like that. Yeah. And it's catchy, and it's exciting, not because they tell me I have to, but because they're so blessed, they're so awesome, there's so many awesome things happening in their life, I'm like, um, do I want to live like the grouch over there, or the person with a smile on the face over here? I want the smile, right? That's what the world needs to see, too. They don't want people beating them down about Jesus. They want to see people living in victory because they understand it, they've experienced it, they know it. You won't have to do any preaching. Your yeah. life will do the talking. Yeah. The Holy Spirit through you will do the convicting. Boom, they're there. Is so. that really a, a hard <laughs> attitude? <laughs> it's really a hard attitude. You know, like our kids can do something that we ask and they do it with a frown on the face and, you know, an attitude and their step, you know, and a lot of us, I think we fall into the works thing and, oh, I'm going to just do, I'm going to do this for God, I'm going to do that for God, but God sees our heart attitude when we're doing it, and so he sees us when we're doing it because we feel like we have to, or because we know it's the godly thing to do, or the Christianese thing to do, like he wants to see our hearts as, I just love God, I'm doing this Purely because I love God, not because I'm expecting God to give me something in return or anything like that, or because it's going to make me feel all warm and fuzzy inside because these people are happy. <laughs> he wants us to do something just because we love Him. Yes. Cool. No, I was just going to say, like, sorry. Um, like Matthew talks about that treasure. Like in His joy, so let everyone go after the treasure, and that's the way we have to look at Jesus. Like, he is the treasure. Right. He's yeah, everything, he's and that's 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 what was was spoken in the me early on in my walk was you treasure Jesus, you treasure Him, and that's I think that's what totally changed my whole walk with God. Because it's not like oh, I'm just walking with Jesus, and I'm treasuring Him. Nothing else even compares to Him. Nothing, nothing else looks more beautiful than Him. Nothing else looks more more desirable than Jesus. And I think that was that was what like totally just wrecked me from that spoken into you about that and that's that's I don't know I just want to add that because I think that's cool that's it's just continually that treasuring that scripture itself always is spoken to me. Yeah. like he's so in his joy everyone's like that field over there what, what, what about that you know he's like no I'm I'm, I'm trading all that mm -hmm. for this and the, you know this treasure so I don't know I think that's just the way so cool. it's a little bit mm -hmm. cool. no, I, I just reminded of that story in the Bible where um, it was Paul and then rolled up in that that lady with her son, she had like a little bit of flour left and he's like, said something like, woman, make me a cake or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, and then so it was her last bit, she would have had not, no more food for a kid. And then so she did and got like all of a sudden all her, all her pots were filled to the max with flour and all this stuff like that. So, of course. Yeah. And she didn't, yeah, she just did a uh, sacrifice for the, for the man that was the man of God. Good. That's awesome. Also, a thing I want to share about obedience is a lot of times we get stuck in the same old routine, the same kind of mindset, and that's why sometimes we're like, God, we want to be obedient, but we're battling constantly our flesh, and we keep saying, we're going to do that, we fall. Do that, we fall. And it's a constant thing. And my mom, when she preached a while, uh, not too long ago, maybe a couple months ago, two months ago, she said something that stuck with me. She actually challenged everyone to say, why don't we just try one week with renewing our minds and see how that goes? And I didn't talk about it, probably because I fell on my face every single day trying to, but I at least attempted to do it, and it's hard. Because when you can actually say that I renewed my mind, and you're changing the way you think or see things, it also changes your heart, and therefore, the things that you say that you struggle with, 
you're being obedient and, and, and therefore blessings come and you're blessing so many other people by your obedience. But it's not easy to, you know, crucify your flesh and do what's right. It's something we all battle with. You know, obviously Paul speaks big on that um, and things that we struggle with. Um, and I also wanted to do something that involved everyone here because I know I don't want to just sit up here and talk, but I wanted to be in groups of three or four. I, I really feel just in my life alone when people come up to me with testimonies about, I don't know, people that were healed or things they saw or what God did in their life. Those are faith builders, okay? And that's something that me and a lot of my friends that I know, when they tell me, I don't just get excited about it. I go home and I think about it. I pray about it. I want to see more of it. And I think when we get in groups of three or four, and we talk about in our lives at the times that we were obedient and things that we saw out of obedience because we were simply just obedient to God, all the amazing things that happened. And I know there's people here that have been on a mission trip, whether it's Dominican, Costa Rica, anywhere, even somewhere else, that I'm sure just by hearing from those people that they went through hell. I mean, they, they, what the stories I've heard is being disobedient, but then all of a sudden being obedient, what God's blessed them and how he's brought them through it. Um, I mean, Andy alone, I know you told me plenty of stuff that was hard for you at first, and you too. And it's 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 taking you out of this realm and it's putting you into another whole atmosphere where you're like, okay, I want to be obedient, but man, what does obedient look like now? Like, this is totally different. And I think if, you know, whoever's in your guys' groups will be very blessed with what you guys have to share um, with your testimonies on your admissions trips. Um, but if you want to get in groups of three or four, and I just want us to go about... Talking about obedience um, for about five minutes, and then I'll come back up. I already told mine, so I'm not going to go over it again. Like I'm already serving Christian. When I 
wake up in the morning, I'm happy, and 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 I'
I think that means time to so anyways, I wanted to do that because I wanted us to, to get us in a, in a mode where we're more passionate about the subject, but um, I don't think anyone can honestly say that the subject of obedience is, is easy because what it's doing is it's uncomfortable. A lot of times it's a str it's stretching. It's doing sometimes what we don't want to do. Being obedient is getting out of your comfort zone many times. Um, and there was also a part of the story with uh, Solomon, with him being obedient and being blessed, then him taking everything that God blessed him with and turning it more into a curse from his own, his own self. But that's not where it ends. So there's another part of the story that Joel's going to share. <laughs> well, you as you read through the Old Testament, you'll you'll read that Solomon started. You you read Song of Solomon, and you know there's all these graphic, detailed love things in there that you're like, oh my gosh, is that in the Bible? And if anybody's never read that book, I want to challenge you to do it. You want to talk about s destroying the stereotype of the Bible? Read Song of Solomon. You'll you'll be blushing before you're done with the book. I guarantee it. But that was Solomon in his younger years. That was Solomon where he was truly in love with God. And then Solomon started writing Proverbs. And he had a lot of wisdom and a lot of stuff. And he eventually wandered away. And, you know, you talked about the thousand women he had. I mean, he had 77 kids. I have four, and that was 77 was a bit much. I know my mom had eight, so... But um, that would be a bit much. But Solomon then, as he wandered away from God, he got to a place of such loneliness. I mean, think about it. You have a guy who, who had everything. He had all the wisdom. He obviously had all the women wanting him. He was the wealthiest man at that time. And he had peace on all sides. So no one would dare attack him. He had truces with every army around him. And everybody wanted to be Solomon. And yet he was completely empty and alone. And I think the thing that I want to challenge is myself tonight as I'm hearing this for all of us is oh, God is a gentleman. I was just telling this to Micah. And I say this a lot. God is a gentleman. He will not force you to obey. And many of us have stories because we've decided that we knew the right way to travel. And we've seen a lot of dead ends and a lot of rocky roads and a lot of bruised knees and 
you know, we've all got bloodied up some way, somehow, because we thought we knew better than God. And God will not force us to ever obey Him. And if we don't, the consequences are on us, not on God. And I want to challenge us, because a lot of times you look and say, oh God, why'd you let that happen to me? It's really on us, because we walked away from Him. And just like Solomon did. And at the end of Solomon's life, he writes the book of Ecclesiastes. And if any of you have read that book, it's one of the more depressing books you'll ever read. Because he recounts his whole life and sums it up, I think it's in what, six chapters? Yeah. Or eight? Twelve? Okay, it's twelve chapters. But it, it is easy reading, but it's he sums it up. And he basically says, everything is worthless. If you want to take it, that's pretty much what he said. I'll read you the key verse. Go ahead. The key verse of the whole book says, and this is from Ecclesiastes 12, 13. It says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Keep, fear God, meaning to be in awe of God, so much so that you obey everything he tells you to do. And that's the sum of everything. So he's looking back in his life and saying, I had everything, and I wound up empty. And now he's saying, this is what you need to do. Go back to the beginning. How many of us would rather in our lives not pull a Solomon? How many of us would like to do a do-over now as opposed to when we're 40 or 50 or 80 or whatever and say, oh my gosh, I've wasted all this time? Because you see people throughout their lives, I've heard so many people with excuses of, you know what? I'll, get, I'll go to church or I'll really get to know God better when I'm you know, older. Right now, I just want to have my fun. And now all of a sudden, first of all, you're not guaranteed to get older. That was proven yesterday at ECMC. You're, no, you're not guaranteed another second. But even if you do make it that old, now you got to look back on your life. When you live a life now, you've got regrets. And you got all these things you're saying, oh my gosh, Solomon, the whole book was, I regret doing all these things. And yet, this is a man who had everything. So I want to challenge that us that we take a look at Solomon's life and we don't duplicate that. Let's make a decision now that we're going to be obedient to God. We're going to do everything he asks. Now, I'm sure none of us have been given the word from God that we're the most wise person. I'm sure sometimes we think we are, but Solomon was. So I want to challenge us to that because his story didn't end sad. He ended up coming back to God. And he lived the remainder of his days with God. So it can be done. Well, anyways. Um, I, that's all I really wanted to touch base on. It's just the story of Solomon tithing, which I thought was really important. Uh, faith and patience. And um, I wanted to end with prayer. And then, do you guys, do you guys have anything else you want to share? <laughs> She's like, mm. <laughs> Did you want us to pray with you? Huh? Did you want us to pray with you? No. Okay. Okay. All right. Dear God, just thank you for tonight, this time of fellowship. Lord, I thank you for the message. Um, I pray that the message wasn't just something that we could uh, listen to and think, oh, that's nice, and walk out of here the same person, Lord, but... I speak to myself even when I say this, Lord, but I pray that we got something out of this. Um, that it was able to turn our hearts, open our minds. And Lord, give us maybe a little bit more understanding of the cost of even being obedient, Lord. Just a simple concept of being obedient. But, Lord, it, it does take a lot, Lord. But you didn't promise us a good life, but you promised you'd be there for us every step that we take. And I pray in the good times and the bad times, Lord, we rejoice, Lord. We rejoice no matter what. Whether we're going through good times or bad, Lord, we're called to rejoice and worship you, Lord. And I just pray that everyone here, um, that they open their hearts, even through this next week, and they'd be challenged, Lord, with, you know what, even these little things I may want to go back to. Um, because there's plenty of times where you tell us to do something, Lord, and out of disobedience, it doesn't just affect us. It affects the people that you want us to reach out to. It affects the people that are going to be blessed just out of our own obedience. I just pray that everyone here is blessed by the message, Lord, that you spoke them clearly through me, even through me being nervous and this being my weakness of standing in front of people, Lord. I just know that um, you take our weaknesses and you turn them into our strengths, Lord. 
And uh, I just thank you for this night. And I just pray that we have safe travels on the way home, Lord. And I just thank you in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.